Welcome to Capable of Change, and today we're going to do another podcast. It's going to be a little different than it's been before. I'm sure you can probably see that you can see me, whereas before in my previous podcast, I have been sound only, um, and there was a reason for that, um, and it's pretty much because of the nature of this podcast. Um, It was done intentionally. And I always say that I'm not embarrassed. I tell everybody I'm not embarrassed of my past. But honestly, like most people, I am concerned about the repercussions of people in the professional field where I work. I don't want them to find out that I've been a junkie. I work with children lots of times. And, you know, I I just, I worry about what they would think about that. So... You know, not everybody is super understanding when it comes to what you did in your past. But recently, I was the recipient of a grant from a nonprofit group called Emancipate North Carolina. Shout out to them. They are an amazing group that works to mobilize community leaders and train them to stop the school-to-prison pipeline It's all about um, helping the community work with the police force to make better laws and help people understand what it's like for formerly incarcerated individuals. So um, I received a grant from them, and in doing so, I had to write up a public bio. So, um, I mean, pretty much the cat's out of the bag. So I just thought, in my own life, I would also just continue to move forward with that, and I just really needed to decide what I wanted to keep secret and what I wanted, you know, people to know, and really, in doing something like this, you know, vulnerability is an issue, so... Um, I just thought I'd just put it all out there and see how it goes, you know. Um, And if I, you know, I would just tell people my story and hope that they understood. In my regular life, people have understood. People have been very gracious and um, people have been very understanding because drug and addiction is, drug addiction is something that, really affects everybody today. So, um, you know, I don't want to say what do I have to lose because there's plenty I have to lose. But, you know, I just decided that we'd start doing it this way from now on. And once you do that, well, I mean, it's done. So here we go. Um, Today, I really want to talk about Like I said, I'm going to tell you guys my story, Um, but YouTube sets limits on how long you can make your videos, and that limit is an hour, so um, it would really take a lot longer for me to talk about how I became an addict than an hour, (laughs) so I'm going to save the how I got clean part for another day, and we're just going to concentrate on what... Well, what I really want to do is try to help people avoid some of the pitfalls that I made and really try to pinpoint what makes a person turn to drugs, why a person seeks out drugs. I feel like most people listening to this podcast probably have some experience with drugs. So, um, you know, we'll just talk a little bit about my story and where I think we as a group can change so that people like me don't turn into drug addicts. Um, And with that said, like, you know, I was a normal person growing up. I grew up in Goldsboro, North Carolina. It's about an hour away from the beach, um, the North Carolina coast. Um, It was a nice little rural town. Um, My parents made a good living. Um, I was a normal child. I was an only child, so I was super spoiled, spoiled rotten. My dad was a photographer for National Geographic. He made a really good living, and um, we had a good amount of money. 
Um, my mom worked at a daycare. Everything was normal. I, um, I didn't do without. And, you know, there was no abuse. There was no creepy uncles. Like, nothing that would normally make a person what people think that the past of a drug addict is like. Um, I lived a normal life. You know, um, in fact, when I went to prison, um, in a rehab part of the prison, I, and well, while I was in a program, I had a counselor in there. I, counselor, I'm going to use that term loosely, but anyway, I had a lady that worked at the prison. She insisted that, that I must have had some sort of trauma in my past that I had hidden or forgotten about or pushed away because nobody could have possibly been nobody like me I was telling her I was just a normal person a normal child childhood and she said that that wasn't possible that there must have been something I was hiding something I hadn't remembered so I did do a deep delve into my past and my family um, it wasn't really too deep because, you know, I had a normal life. Like, there wasn't anything to hide. Um, so, I mean, I did drugs because I chose to do drugs. I wasn't trying to, like, cover up any shame or any, any issues, um, any trauma. I mean, even though some people really think that that's, the only way you can possibly be a drug addict is because you're trying to run from something. Yes, later on, after I had been doing drugs for many, many years, then it had compiled and I was upset with myself and hated my life and upset about the things that I had done and ashamed of the things that I had done. And that kept me in the drug game. But it didn't start out that way. You know, um, I did have family members that have previous genetic links. Um, I was raised with my stepfather. He adopted me when I was like three. So you'll hear me talk about him calling my father. But my real father, my biological father, he was a drug addict. He was a crackhead and a severe alcoholic. His parents were both alcoholics. His brother and sister were all alcoholics. So we do have that genetic link. Also, my grandmother's mother, that would be my great-grandmother, she, um, she killed herself when my grandma was in school, high school. She got off the bus, came home from school, and there my grandma was, had shot herself, great-grandma had shot herself in the head. And that was back when mental illness for a woman was pretty much just hysteria. They didn't understand it, so... Um, there was that. So I do have a genetic background predisposition, as you call it, to addiction and mental illness. Um, but with that said, you know, it, there are really some other factors that made me turn to drugs. A lot of people ask me and have asked me, you know, how I became a junkie. And when I reply to them, I usually say, how could I not? with culture and society as it is today. So you see where I'm going to go with this. Um, I definitely do not blame myself 100%. Um, it, I was diagnosed with hyperactivity early on at age 7. I had a lot of problems in school, sitting still, keeping quiet, normal problems that are... A lot of children struggle with this, right? Like... Um, nowadays, they call it ADHD, but in my time, they called it hyperactivity. So, I was diagnosed with hyperactivity, and, um, of course, my mom was concerned that there was something wrong with me. She was aware of my great-grandmother, and people believed that mental illness, you know, skipped generations, and... Uh, my mom was pretty sure that from early on something was wrong with me, 
And I, I really feel like looking back, that made me, that set the stage right. She was looking for it, and she made that well known with doctors. Um, so she took me to a doctor when I couldn't sit still, when I had teachers calling me to the front of the class saying, you know, what's wrong with you? They gave me Ritalin. Um, it did not work for me. In fact, I believe it was the beginning of a compound of much more problems. It led to what essentially would have been maybe an emotional instability. Um, I was up and down, up and down. Um, and I was very emotional about stuff, very on edge. Um, so my pediatrician um, recommended me to another doctor. He was a high-priced um, psychiatrist out of Chapel Hill, really well known. Um, this was in the 90s, so late 80s, 90s. And that psychiatrist had decided that I wasn't ADHD or hyperactive, that I was instead struggling with manic depression, as it was called at that time. Knowing about <clears throat> my great-grandmother's link, my mother also had some bouts with depression. She was on, you know, some depression medications. Um, they diagnosed me with bipolar. <clears throat> like I said, it was called manic depression at the time. And essentially, I was the youngest, I was the first juvenile in North Carolina diagnosed with manic depression. And um, the doctors used this to further their career. It was um, several journal, journal articles that were written about me. Um, and from that moment on, I was given tons of medication. Uh, like I said, my parents had lots of money, so they spent the utmost amount of money trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And the doctors were happy to take it and happy to um, diagnose me with things and happy to give me the newest drugs on the market. So from... Seven to age 20, I had been on 23 different head meds. We're talking about meds like Lamictal, Tegretol, of course, stimulants, Adderall, um, Xylert, um, Lexapro, you know, it just... There, I just, I was on all of them. They would taper me off one and taper me on another. And I'd sometimes be on two at a time. And, you know, there were days when I'd stay up for multiple days at a time. I mean, the side effects of these medications were insane. Not to mention I was going through puberty. I was in school. I was trying to deal with middle school and high school. And um, it was very difficult, um, I think. I really didn't know who I was because I was on all these medications. I was dealing with like an identity crisis. Um, and it just got worse as I got older. And then kids found out I was on medications. And they would make fun of me for it. Um, you know, so my problems were just compounded. Um, you know, side effects were really a serious issue. Um, I gained a lot of weight in, like, my junior year of high school. My parents had given me all these medications, and none had worked, which I'm not even really sure what they thought working was. Um, I guess they wanted me to just sit down and shut up. But I was never that type of person. Um, you know, so I, it was just... It was, it was the same story that a lot of children are going through nowadays. But back then, it wasn't very common. Um, it was just at the beginning of it, just at the beginning of doctors using children and pharmaceuticals to make their careers and fortunes off of. That's pretty much how I feel looking back. I will give a 
the doctor's name was Mark Chandler. You can look him up. Um, I really don't have very much to say about him. But like I said, inevitably what happened is that I learned that it was okay to pop a pill when problems arise. I learned that that was what was expected. Oh, you can't, you're not doing well in school? Take some medicine. You know, like, you cry a lot? Take some medicine. Um, and that, that was, you know, the beginning of my problems. Because when my peers started popping up with their parents Xanax and phenobarbital and stuff, I was like, cool, you know, there's no, like, I'm okay with this, I'll, I'll try it, whatever, I've been taking Adderall forever, like, what's the difference, you know, I didn't really see the harm, and um, at the same time, with that, I grew up in a home with young parents, they listened to music like Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin. They were what you would consider cool parents. My mom had me when she was 20, so she was pretty young. I was an only child. They did not. They made it well known that they didn't want children. They had children. They loved their child that they had. They didn't want any more. <laughs> they wanted to live their own life. And, you know, I grew up in a time where it was cool to... We listened to Kurt Cobain, Smashing Pumpkins, Sublime, Blind Melon. I mean, this is what people were into at the time. And Jimi Hendrix, all these people. It was just the glamorization of drugs. like, And, and nobody seemed to have a problem with it, you know. Um, you can listen to some Sublime lyrics now and all of Blind Melon stuff now and they're just completely talking about drugs, glamorization of drugs. And we just sang along to it as if it was totally okay. Um, I personally really idealized Courtney Love and Janis Joplin. I thought they were great. I listened to them every day. I actually was reading the Courtney Love autobiography whenever I was first approached with heroin. Um, a guy that I was dating at the time needed some money. I wasn't really dating him. I had started dating him. I did not know that he was a junkie yet. Um, there was a while while he was a junkie. I learned later, and I had not. He really did try to try to keep me off drugs. I mean, why wouldn't he? Because I was supporting him, his habit. I would let him borrow money, so... If you got me strung out, he'd have to share, and the money would probably dry up. But um, eventually, I realized that he was a heroin addict. So when I was first presented with heroin, not only did I not have the ability to say no, I did not know yet how to say no, really, to things. I was, you know, concerned about what my peers thought about me and I mean I I knew how to say no to things I think maybe I just didn't want to say no I glamorized it I thought it was cool you know I thought that heroin was something that you could only get in New York City that only rock stars could get so when somebody popped up with some heroin in Goldsboro I was just like wow this is ultra cool this is ultra DL like nobody knows about this this is a secret I want to be in on this secret so you know naturally I was super intrigued I thought drugs were cool I mean we did the dare and we had people come into our school they were lame so and even as a young child, I knew that they were lame and that they were feeding me a bunch of BS. So, you know, like, I had been presented drugs as a solution early on in my life. Um, and at that time, as a teenager, I really didn't see anything 
I wasn't realizing the repercussions of that yet. I wasn't realizing the problems and where it could possibly go. I didn't see anything wrong with it, so using them as a coping mechanism, it didn't seem much far far off, right? Like like I said, in my teens, I had I was the culmination of a ton of doctor prescribed drugs and I was in somewhat of an identity cross crisis. I had my emotions were ruled by drugs, pharmaceuticals, head meds. And I feel like it's real important to distinguish because we as a culture use the word drugs to mean pharmaceuticals, illegal drugs, supplements. I mean, I feel like it's real important to distinguish because of things like this. And top of it, you know, I just thought drugs were cool. The people I idolized, they had drug problems. But in spite of it, they still were out there making music, making films, doing things. Um, I didn't really see the bad part until I had been using for years. Um, and another thing was that I really had a drive to be different. I did not want to be ordinary. The last thing I wanted to be was like everybody else. I thought it was not cool to be the cheerleader. I didn't even, I was, I was the tennis player. I was the complete opposite, right? Like when I played sports, I was like, I'm not going to be a cheerleader. Um, I didn't want to be like everybody else, you know? I wanted to be different. And I realized that drugs could give me that. Um, like it was like an exclusive type thing. I remember thinking early on that one day it would be worth it. I mean, I feel like, you know, I used to say this all the time. If I make it out of this alive, and I'd say it when I was in the depths, if I make it out of this alive, it'll all be worth it. Like, I wanted a tattoo that said it. The thing is, is I didn't quite realize that there was a high probability that it, it would kill me. Um, I'm really lucky that it didn't. And um, I know that, like, some people, I've always really looked up to people who knew what they wanted in life. You know, there are some people, they're like, I'm going to be a lawyer. They go to school. They never have any hiccups. They become a lawyer. Life is good. 2.3 kids, picket fence, dog in the backyard. Everything is great. Um, there's people that are like, I'm going to be a rock star. And they go out and try to be a rock star. But maybe they don't make it. Maybe they do make it. But they never second guess whether or not that's what they're supposed to be. There's these people in the world, and I have never been one of those people, except for when it comes to drugs. I've always thought, even as a young age, especially as a teenager, that I was destined to be a drug addict. And not just a drug addict, a junkie. Uh, I always looked at cocaine and crack and meth as something different than heroin. I thought heroin addicts were not, I thought that they were maybe immune somehow. Like I only, I, it was so glamorized to me at that time that I only saw the benefits, what it possibly could bring. And um, you know, I, I, I just thought that I was, I was going to be a drug addict and that's okay, you know, and honestly, I am here on the other side, just like I knew I would be. So I somewhere deep down inside almost feel like that that was my destiny. Um, but in that I have exposed so many people to drugs and I have exposed them to a life of sorrow and crime and death in many cases in which had they never met me, had their path never crossed with me, they'd probably be alive living their, you know, 2.3 kids and dog in the yard dream. 
I I don't know, but um, I do know that I have lost a lot of people from OD, um, overdose of heroin. I can, there's at least more people than I could count on my hand. Um, just normal people, just like me, and why they lived and why, why I lived and they died, I will never know. Um, and I've seen a lot of them die. And I have to carry it every day on my conscience. I recently just had somebody come visit me. They are homeless. They are have relapsed and are back doing drugs again. They are living a miserable life right now. And it's my fault. I introduced this person to drugs. I showed them how to navigate the heroin game because it's it's not easy it does take work you know but for me drugs it was the only thing I was good at for a long time I struggled finding something I was good at I was no artist I was no like I said cheerleader um I was actually pretty good at tennis I played tennis for a while but you can't play tennis and be a heroin addict <laughs> that kind of goes once you start using so um I started using my senior year of high school and well I was exposed to it my senior year of high school and then I I would use every now and then with my friends but eventually like I said drug addiction takes work so um, I really thought if I'm gonna be an addict if I'm gonna live this life I'm going to be the best at it that I can be. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but that's just how I am. I'm really about being the best that I can be at everything I do. Even today, as a student, I have a 4.0. I will spend a ridiculous amount of time doing my work just because I want it to be perfect. And as a drug addict, I was that same way. I was going to climb to the top of that ladder. And I did heroin addiction. It was just really romanticized for me. I was like being a vampire. Nobody really wants to be a vampire. Nobody thinks about what it would require to be a vampire. But everybody thinks it would be cool, right? Like everybody, like it's glamorized. So it was really a direct result of our culture. Um, we glamorize drug and drugs and drug addiction with movies like Blow and you know like with musicians like Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love like that whole thing is just the glamorization of drug addiction. And they leave out the part that I mean Kurt Cobain is dead um, you know, his life was cut short. So, Janis Joplin, life cut short. Jimi Hendrix, life cut short. These drug addicts, they didn't make it. But all we know as a culture is the works they put out and the story and the glamorization of their life and their drug addiction. You know, drug addiction is no ball game. It was literally 15 years of my life in hell. It was hell. It was a mental hell and a physical hell. It was an emotional hell. It was every hell that I could ever imagine rolled into one. It was super difficult. And now, it's 15 years of my life that I've spent advancing in a game that I just quit. It would be like playing Monopoly for 15 years and then just walking away and turning the board upside down. And just walking away. Like none of that time mattered. Okay. It did what I wanted it to do in the beginning. Which was make me a. Give me depth. I really wanted to be. I didn't want to be that like blonde chick. That was just like a bunch of. of just a pretty girl. I wanted substance. And. I will say that it did give me substance, but I could have found substance in so many other things in life. Um, 
So really, I just, after I got clean, I had to start over from the beginning. And I was super far behind my peers. And it was really difficult seeing people with jobs. And I'm just in school at like 40. Um, you know, I am a little worldly. I'm a little mysterious. But who cares? That's just not cool when you're like 40. Domestic violence, homelessness, being poor, having diseases, everything that comes with drug addiction, not cool. Being in jail, not cool. Being behind your peers, not cool. Having to hide because you can't do a regular podcast like normal people where people see your face, not cool. Like, there are really bad things about it. Almost dying, not cool. You know, another thing I just want to address is the way we teach it our kids about drugs. We teach them that people become addicted to drugs the first time they do it. And that is such a total lie. Like, once a person does a drug and isn't addicted, they begin to think that they are okay to continue. Um, they lied to me. Society lied to me. Ronald Reagan lied to me. And I thought it must all be lies. To tell you the truth, I did heroin for a, a good year without having any physical withdrawal symptoms. The first time I did heroin, the first time I smoked crack, I was like, what is this? I didn't even feel it. My brain did not even know how to register what was happening because it had nothing to base it on. It really took a lot of work um, to see physical symptoms of addiction. Um, like I said, I, I grew up in Goldsboro, and Goldsboro was supposed to be a nice little town. My parents brought me to Goldsboro thinking, oh, it's got great school systems. We'll be able to raise our child here, and she'll be happy, and have none of the problems that's in the big cities. But they were wrong because it was flooded with drugs. It was just everywhere. We lived an hour away from Wilmington. Um, heroin was coming in on the ports and on the boats. And people were bringing it to Goldsboro. Um, And it was, wasn't long before dealers realized that there was money to be made on all these rich white kids. And they set up shop in our town. And the police were too busy being racist and locking up crack dealers to pay it much attention. They weren't really concerned with locking up. I mean, they didn't want to lock up young white kids. They actively looked the other way. There were many, many times they just let me go. They let me go because I was a young white kid with money. And there were many, many, many times they let people go with heroin. But if you had crack or cocaine back then, you might be in trouble. But you have heroin, they're just like, you know, get rid of it, quit doing it. Um, they would just, they would let it go. They were really, in Goldsboro, they're super racist, first of all. When I went to school, um, we were segregated. Goldsboro High School was 98% black. I went to Charles B. Acock. It was 98% white. All the black people lived in town. All the white people lived in the rural areas. All the white people were, the white kids were buying drugs from the black kids. Um, you know, the kids in our school, we would, had tons of money. Our parents had tons of money. And we would readily give it to 
other people for drugs, you know, that was just what was cool. Um, and I had already been exposed to marijuana and acid and ecstasy before I ever did heroin. The first, the first time I did heroin was with a needle. I never, I still to this day, I've probably only put heroin up my nose once or twice. Um, like I said, I was intense about being the best, and I mean, if you're going to do a drug, why not do it the way the doctors give it to you, right? Put it in a syringe, which was incredibly dangerous for a 20-year-old. Um, so, you know, in, in, my, in my experience, a lot of this has to do with policy um, and laws that are made to criminalize based on racism. Um, the police weren't really interested in locking up young white people. So there's a great video called Drugs, What America Gets Wrong About Addiction and Policy. It's by Big Think. And I'll link it down in the comment section or maybe up in the cards or something so you can see it. It really spends a lot of time talking about our culture and the myth that we have sold to everybody as pretty much a, just a bunch of BS. It addresses the myths surrounding addiction, including that you become an addict instantly. Um, I really want people to know that becoming an addict really takes a lot of work. And that's why some drug addicts have excellent work ethic um, because... If you are not an addict and I told you to go get some heroin, what would you do? You know, because it takes work, it takes skill to navigate that. And it's like a game of cat and mouse between the junkies and the police. So, you know, to wrap it up, the biggest, contribu the biggest contributor to my addiction was the prevalence of juvenile pharmaceuticals in my life. Um... Please don't give your children stimulants. Please try natural things. Therapy, behavioral modification, st uh, supplements. Try anything you can without giving them stimulants. The actual act of stim giving them stimulants is really hard on their developing mind but it also really shapes the way they think in the future. Um, and head meds, like, don't give your kids head meds. I understand that there are children that need medications. They are severely depressed. They are cutting themselves. They are harming themselves. But there has got to be other methods plenty of other methods that need to be tried first before you start drugging your child. And even adults, you really need behavior modification. I would have definitely benefited from some CBT or some sort of behavior therapy at a young age. But my parents were young and busy and concerned with their own life and they were really looking for a quick fix like most people are. Um, another thing is A culture that glamorizes addiction. I mean, we all are guilty of enjoying movies like Blow. I mean, they, they, you know, Narcos. Our TV's full of it. But I do think we're doing better at it today than we did when I was younger, in the 90s, in the 80s. Um, I guess there's so many new drugs now that it's different 
the when I was younger, we did a bunch of acid. I mean, I did start out taking acid and smoking pot first. Um, I was exposed to those drugs first, but like I said, I was exposed to drugs long before I realized drugs were bad. I was exposed to drugs that were supposed to be good, that were supposed to be helping me, and as a teenager, distinguishing between those two things was difficult. So, um, I do think we are making positive strides. Um, looking back, I don't think anybody knew that the heroin epidemic would kill so many people. Um, and people are scared of it now, and it makes its way into media. But we still have a long way to go in Glen in glamorizing addiction because we still do that quite a bit and I really believe that like as an only child I was into things that were too old for me I hung out with a lot of older people like most kids do and I was exposed to things I probably should have been watching Barney and instead you know I was watching I don't know the wall at a young age like my parents I was just watching what they were watching and they were really into rock and roll and um, you know like they were doing adult stuff I was a child living in an adult world so you know um, that really contributed a lot to my views on drugs and, and another thing that I had a problem well mostly is that I wanted to be different I wanted to be cool I wanted to fit in and we all want to fit in we all can succumb to peer pressure but I feel like um, I really wanted to be different my parents I was that kid right that everybody was wearing tapered jeans and I was wearing bell bottoms like if you have a child like that, or you know a child like that, or see a child like that, you really need to watch them because they are really susceptible to falling into the wrong crowd, as they say, right? So I really had a, a, a deep-seated need to be different than everybody else. Um, and then finally, laws that put money over people, people. Um, and that's really the biggest problem that we have today other than medicating our children with stimulants at a ridiculously young age the laws are just a mess I mean policy is full of lies and myths we tell people things like you become addicted to a drug the first time you try it or we demonize it so bad. We equate marijuana with things like heroin. And it's just like completely different drugs. And once somebody smokes some marijuana, they're like, oh, this is not bad. This is actually pretty cool. Um, okay, bring on the heroin. Like, it's not like that. But something in your brain, like, clicks. It just kind of gets, like, watered down. And so... I think we really need to be careful about the wordage that we use. It's the same with like opiates. We have really gone into demonizing opiates when opiates are an amazing discovery. I don't know what people would do if we didn't have a way to regulate pain. I watched my mother die of cancer. I could not imagine what it would have been like not to have her own fentanyl. She needed fentanyl to navigate the pain of cancer. And we were taking her fentanyl. That's just, you know, like, we didn't realize that, we didn't realize that it was such a bad drug at the time because it was so new and how addictive it was. And that goes into a whole other thing about the Sackler family and how they marketed these drugs to people. They 
you know, we didn't realize what they were, but to demonize them today is almost just as bad because now people that need opiates are having a hard time getting them. And drugs like Suboxone, and I hesitate to say methadone, but still, drugs, maintenance drugs, are wrapped up in the category with heroin and fentanyl. And when you talk about opiates on a broad sense, Suboxone and heroin and fentanyl are completely different drugs. Suboxone is a great drug. It is super necessary. It is super helpful to getting people clean. And we just demonize them all across the board. It's like I heard recently that I have a friend. She's a nurse and she's been on Suboxone and she's going to lose her job because where she works has a no opiate policy you know and it's just like it's across the board opiates are bad which you know i don't believe they are so i really feel like we should be very specific in our wordage when we come down to talking about drugs and drug abuse um we should be honest with people about drug addiction. We should not glamorize drugs. And we shouldn't tell people that they're going to get addicted to heroin the first time they try it. Because when they do, and they don't get addicted to it, then they're like, okay, this is not that bad. I will just keep doing it. They lied to me. They lied to me about everything. And it's not like, like so like right there in your face like that. It's just something that happens in your mind. It just changes. Your mind changes about the way you view stuff. When when you really have a hard time deciphering what's true and what's not in the drug game, you kind of feel like, well, I'm just going to go at it myself and figure it out on my own because everything they told me were lies. So, I mean, there are some real telltale signs looking back um, in my life about I think somebody could have known early on that I was going to have a problem with drugs if you look back and there could have been some measures put in place to stop it but overall the problem was not with me or my parents the problem was with society as a whole and if we want to keep children off of drugs and alcohol, I also had a big problem with alcohol. Um, we really need to teach them coping mechanisms like meditation and deep breathing and supplements, um, plant medicines. We need to turn to these things first before we start medicating our children and um, locking them up because society is really to blame for this and it is a hell of our own making so um, I just you know I think that's important to note um, and so really that's about it that is um, those are the things that I feel like contributed to my drug addiction. Another day, we'll talk about how I got clean, and um, we'll continue to talk about, you know, topics that I feel are necessary for navigating recovery, um, because it is full of myths and lies and bullshit, too. So, like, I'm not even going to get into it. So anyway, we'll wrap it up there. Until next time, please be good to yourself. You deserve it. You are 100% worth it. You are enough.